I'm Alexa. Uh, I mainly work on container runtimes, um, but this is this particular problem that I'm going to talk about today, and the project I'm going to talk about um, is solving a problem that we have in container runtime worlds, but it sort of applies to most system tools. Most tools have these kinds of problems. Um, so the core problem we're trying to solve is that um, when you have a any system tool that needs to operate on some sort of root FS. It doesn't have to be like a container root file system. It can be a web server that has a server root, or it can be a tar archive uh, that's extracting tar archives into a particular folder, basically anything like that. Um, a lot of tools like that, and I would say probably most system tools need to interact with unsafe paths at some point. Um, and the core problem is that a path where an attacker can modify path components, like for instance swapping one of them with a symlink, um, you can very easily end up um, operating on paths outside the root of us. Um, and this has been a source of many security problems in container runtimes, where like, yeah, the container system itself is like fairly secure, but the problem is that when the administrative process has to actually operate on the file system, you end up with breakouts and they're all kind of ugly. Um, and this this is like the most trivial example. There are more fun examples um, that you can ask about later if you're interested. Um, so what are the solutions for this? So um, uh, there is the old school way, which is the open at O pathway. Um, that's been around forever. I mean, I say Linux 2639, but actually you could do it before then, um, where you effectively uh, try to emulate uh, a path lookup, but you restrict it manually in user space. So this is the old-fashioned way. A lot of tools do it like this. Um, and uh, the newer way, which is something that I worked on um, a few years ago, uh, is open at 2, which is an in-kernel way to do that. So effectively, when you're doing a lookup, um, you can just say, you can add resolution flags where you s can restrict what the resolution does. So you can say, OK, I want this resolution, this open um, operation, I wanted to resolve the path as if it was in a ch root with, with this, from this directory. Or you can also say, I want to resolve it without any symlinks at all. This is different to no follow wedge, it's just the trailing one, but you can restrict all symlinks at all. Um, resolve beneath is kind of, um, it's kind of similar to in roots, so the ch root thing is where like an absolute symlink would be scoped, um, but with beneath it would just give you an error um, if you try to walk outside of it. Um, uh, this is modeled after some FreeBSD behavior. And then you can also block magic links, which are like proc self FD style symlinks that are not actually real symlinks. They're this like magical kernel thing that um, doesn't actually resolve the same way as regular symlinks. Uh, and you can also block uh, any mount point crossings, including bind mounts with no XDEV. Um, and the last two actually, it was not actually possible to block these at all from user space in a race free way um, before open had to. So those are the two like major ways of doing it. Um, and obviously this is a very old problem. I mean, tools have been having to deal with this problem since probably since like Unix v1 or something like this, like a very common problem. Um, and everyone has their own ways of doing it. Um, I come, I mean, I come from the container world, so a lot of these examples are container related. Um, but the key idea is that everyone has their own way of doing it. Some tools use open 2 other tools do a ch root, but the problem with using a ch root is that it's kind of annoying to use from a multi-threaded program. You have to do use v fork if you want to be really efficient about it and it has a bunch of other issues. Um, and then there's also this file path secure join Thing, which um, I wrote a while ago, um, but it's not race safe. So you can, you, it, it will give you like a safe path to operate on, but this is like based on the model of like paths are safe to use, which is not actually true because you can swap out any of the components. Um, and yeah, systemd has its own thing. Um, and Golang, uh, for the few months ago, they started working on their own version, um, though it actually, their version, because it has to be platform uh, independent, um, it actually only blocks like all awesome symlinks, um, which I think is, I mean, it'll be nice because you can avoid certain attacks, but uh, you can't, um, you can't use it for an actual root effects because it would just block everything. Um, and if you're very lucky, um, the tool will actually also verify that the thing it opened is the path it expected. Not all tools do that, um, which is always fun. Uh, so yeah, so with openat 2 and with these other things, you can, you can resolve a path and get a handle to it. Um, and that's actually most of the work, um, at least in theory. Um, but there's still a lot of extra things that need to get done. You need to make sure you use uh, all the at versions of syscalls, which requires some fiddling because some operations don't have an obvious at syscall, you can, like op open at, make their at, and get it Um And also, like, the behavior of following symlinks is actually kind of um, difficult to follow for some syscalls, um, and some syscalls can't operate on file descriptors directly, so you have to be careful with how you do them. Um, and that's like the basic stuff. I mean, you also have to, if you want to make like, uh, make your all, um, or like recursively remove a directory, those also require a little bit more wor work. Um, so the current status is that, I mean, what most people end up doing is that they end up implementing these things on like an ad hoc basis of like, okay, well, we'll have to do this thing, so we'll write our own version of this particular thing. Um, so what libpathRS is, is it's a library that I wrote, it's written in Rust, um, but it has, uh, CFFI interface you can use from C like very easily. Um, and 
it, um, it wraps all the most common interfaces you need for operating on a root file system or on a, any kind of file, file system you want to keep things scripting. Um, it has C and Go bindings. Um, and uh, yeah, currently it basically just does the chroot stuff because that's the main thing we need for containers. And I think most people uh, like the chroot cell thing. Um, but doing the resolve beneath where it gives you an error, that's also like very easy, easy to add um, if anyone wants it. Um, and uh, the nice thing about having a library for this is that uh, we can opportunistically use new kernel features um, if they're available. Um, which is, I mean, uh, if every project has to do it their own way, it's um, it's kind of becomes a bit of a mess. Um, so this is what it looks like from Rust. Uh, the key thing is that yeah, you have this root that you open, and then everything is done in relation to it. Um, uh, when you open a file, it's a two-step process. I'll get into why in a second. Um, but yeah, so you can resolve a path, and then you can reopen it to get an actual handle that you can like read. Um, you can create files. There's, you have like ocreate style, atomic create and open. Um, for stuff that you can't do that with, you can just create any kind of inode. You can create sim links. You can create um, hard links. You can create whatever you like. Um, and then you can also request to make directories and remove directories, um, which it's uh, it's actually a little bit surprising how tricky it is to get. With OpenAT2, it's okay, but with like um, with like the old school way of doing it, it's a little bit complicated. Um, and yeah, there's a docs on um, uh, on docs.rs. You can you can read more if you like. Um, and this is what the C API looks like. Um, so it, this is basically doing the open operation again. Um, the key thing to note is that uh, 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 unlike the Rust version, where it's like oh you have this object you are dealing with, um, everything is file descriptor based. Um, so which is like the most like nice C like API you could get for this, where um, you now th this has a slight downside, which is that you have to make sure you always use the path arrest handlers for this, because if you use the wrong one, if you just try to open out with it, it wouldn't be safe. Um, but this, at least doing it this way, makes it easier to write bindings, and also um, it makes you don't have to like call particular free handlers and yada yada. Um, so this is like the nicest way of writing a regular C program. Um, the only thing is that uh, we don't return error nodes. We have like our own error thing, but it's basically it's very similar to the way that like error nodes work. We get a negative error, and then you can just get the information from path arrest about what the error was. Um, yeah, uh, when I said reopen, so um, you would think, oh, well, why can't you just like do the regular open? It actually turns out that this reopen primitive is actually useful for a bunch of things. Um, uh, in particular, the most common example. Um, so sometimes you need to reopen the same path multiple times. And when I say open, I don't mean like a dupe. I mean like an actual open. Um, the most common example of this is in containers when we have to create a console. Um, dev PTS inside a container is uh, is unique to the container when we mount it. it it's um, it's basically uh, each one's isolated from each other. Uh, but the problem is that if you were to if you wanted to create like uh, you know Docker exec or Podman exec or run C exec into the container, you have to create a new console. Uh, if the container file system has changed, you can get tricked into opening a random file. Now you can you can defend against this in some ways, but like it'd be nice if you can avoid it entirely. So what uh, at least LXC does is that it um you open the PTMX handle as opath first, and then you reopen it each time you need a new console. And that way it's race free, and there's no way a container can attack you um, that way. Um, and so yeah, that's the main reason. Uh, the other <coughs> slightly um, a uh, selfish reason is that it's a little bit easier to implement if you only have to deal with OPath when doing resolutions. So doing it in two steps is easier. I'll explain what, this actually will come up in a second. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the API. I mean, it's not very complicated. It's I mean, uh, getting sort of all the security stuff right was a little bit complicated, but um, it uh, you know it's fairly easy to use. I, I would think at least I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but hopefully you agree. Um, but uh, the other thing that we have, and this is so, the regular. Path operation stuff. I think most system tools have to deal with um, the proc. We also um, in container runtimes in particular, we have to deal with procfs a lot. Um, and so this is a little bit more specialized. Though I mean, I mean, a lot of tools have to deal with procfs, but not as many as just regular file systems. So um, procfs is a little annoying because um, unlike uh, operating our rootfs, where like the main thing you're worried about is opening files outside the root directory. Um, with procfs, the thing you're worried about is um, with ProcFS, the thing you're worried about is you need to open a very specific file. Because ProcFS, there's a lot of operations that you can only do in ProcFS. You can only set app armor labels, and SCLinux labels can only set for a process in through ProcFS. Uh, certain like reopening and so on and so on, like ProcSelfXE and ProcSelfFD there are um, these like magic links. The only real way to operate on them is through ProcFS. And the problem is, is that if you open the wrong file, you end up doing the wrong thing. So um, And so it's a little bit more. Um, of a problem to deal with, and uh, yeah, uh, it should be noted that I mean, like every programming, every program I think I can think of assumes that proc is like implicitly trusted. Like if proc is there, they just use proc and they don't really care. Uh, and the problem is it deals with it results in security issues. So um, in container runtimes in Run C, we had a couple security issues. I mean, these are the two like the two first ones we had. We had a couple of others that were similar, 
where, um, so you would think, oh, proc is safe because, oh, well, who can, who can configure proc? It turns out that it is possible to configure Kubernetes to create a fake procfs that is actually a tempfs, and then you can then fill it with fake files, and then at the time, runc would write the app armor label to the app armor write, like set file, uh, but it actually would do nothing because it was a tempfs file. Um, now, we fixed this by checking that it is an actual procfs file by like doing um, statfs. The problem is that actually that isn't enough um, because uh, okay, if you make a tempfs, the, the, you know you can detect if it's tempfs. But um, there are some procfs files that are uh, no op writable. So proc self shed is a file that you can write anything to, and it will do nothing. So if you bind mounted proc, if you could configure a container where proc self shed is bind mounted on top of proc self at a um, uh, app armor exec, then uh, we would check that it's a procfs file, we'd be like, oh, it's great, and then you would write it, and it would do nothing. Um, and now we can, now with resolve no xdev, you can detect this. Um, so with open at two, this is like basically solved. There is an additional problem, which is magic links, um, because magic links are not regular sim links. Like when you open it, the kernel like pipes you through to the underlying file. The problem with that is, is that um, you can't use resolve no xdev to block them because you're going through a, to a different mount by doing it. But if you mount on top of a sim link, which is something you can do, if you mount something else on top of the sim link, you can be tricked into opening something else, and there's no way of, you know, easy way of detecting it. Um, so there are patches, there is now finally patches to, um, to block doing some of these mounts um, in Linux, uh, though they don't block everything, that's gonna happen later. Um, but we have to deal with this with old kernels anyway. Uh, yeah. So um, uh, with the Procofest API, the, the main thing that we're worried about is, um, De detecting an attack. Um, there are some cases where you won't be able to do anything, but it's better to get an error than to create a container with the wrong um, app armor labels, right? Um, and so the main thing we use is that there is a, well, new, this API is like six years old now, but there is a new mount API where you can create an entirely private um, mount instance that is inside your process. So it never, it never appears in the file system. You can have it like inside your process, and it's a file descriptor you can use with the access calls to do all your operations. Um, so you can do that with FS open and open tree, depending on what context you're in. Um, unfortunately, you can't use it for unprivileged programs easily. Um, so we have to deal with using regular slash proc for some stuff. Um, but using that, you can make some, most of this stuff safe. Um, and then when we actually do operations, we either use openat 2 or we have a very restrictive OPATH resolver just for Procfs. And um, this is why I mentioned that the reopening thing is easier um, because we can't reopen because to reopen, you need to use Procfs. And obviously, in the Procfs resolver, we can't use Procfs. So we actually, I actually did implement like the, like, one shot open without doing OPATH stuff, um, and that was very annoying. So um, anyway, you you have those are the ways we would do lookups, um, and yeah, libpathers itself uses it as I said the reopening stuff, but also verification of the path and everything else, um, and like stuff like checking syscuddles and a couple other things. They're all done through this Procfs um, thing to make sure that they're safe. So the API looks like this. Um, there is a global Procfs handle that run that Pathfinder uses internally. You can just use that yourself, um, and yeah, you say, oh, I want to open relative to. Uh, thread self. The reason for this is because on older, like pre 317 kernels, you can't specify, uh, there is no, there's a thing called proc thread self. So you have proc self, which is your current PID, like the um, thing, and then you also have proc thread self, which is your current TID, your, your thread ID. Um, but this doesn't exist on pre 317 kernels, so we have to emulate it, and so um, that's the way the API looks. Um, you can also make your own handle if you want. Um, and yeah, you can also have magic links. So the key, one thing to note is that when we do open, regular open, that doesn't follow magic links. You have to do open follow to follow magic links. Um, and you can also read link. Um, and then these are two examples of something we actually do in run C, although obviously the, the code is in, in Go, not in, not in, um, not in C. But um, you can, uh, yeah, so it's the same idea where you want to open the exact thing, and then yeah. I mean, the API looks kind of similar. Um, it's just more wordy because it's, it's C code. Um, the one thing to note is that we set oh no follow is the way you say don't follow magic links. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the main difference. Um, and yeah, what, just the one thing to note is that for, um, for non magic links, um, there are some limitations to this stuff, unfortunately, because it, there are still some holes. Um, but yeah, for non magic links, open at two is enough. Unfortunately, open at two is not. Uh, usable everywhere because um, OpenAT2 uses a particular style of, um, it's a, what's called an extensible structure, as it's called, um, which seccomp can't filter properly. Like, you can't filter the, the flags inside the structure. Um, funnily enough, last week when I was at Linux Plumbers, uh, we actually had a session on how we can fix this. So I will be working on this when I get back home. So hopefully soon it'll be possible to um, restrict um, OpenAT2 so you can use it everywhere. Like, for instance, SystemD can't use it because they have their own seccomp filters. Um, but uh, regardless, we need to have um, a backup, and yeah, so for the backup, 
kind of funnily enough, for the non-open R2 case, you actually need a newer kernel because we need to be able to detect what the mount is. Um, we need the static, D, uh, static mount ID support. Um, and then for magic links, we need to detect, basically for magic links, you need to detect whether or not the magic link, whether the thing on top of the magic link is the same mount, um, which is uses statics, um, and the problem is that that's not race-free. So OpenR2 stuff is race-free because the kernel can detect if something changed. For magic links, we can't do that, so you, you've, to be race, for race safety, you need to be able to use the new AMAPS API, and you also need to have privileges at the moment. Um, this is an open problem for how we can solve this um, in the kernel. Um, but yeah, so what's next? Um, I released libpath 0.1 um, a few weeks ago. Um, my plan is to fix a couple, a couple more things and then release the next version um, next month. Um, and then for the rest of the year, I'll be working on um, porting Umochi to, Umochi is an image tool that I wrote for OCI, which you can use to operate in OCI images. And it's a like, complicated enough tool that it has to do a lot of files and operations that it probably will show all the bugs we have in it, or all the misfeatures we have in the API, um, if there are any. Uh, and then um, once that's done, then I'll work on the run C port to libpathrs, and then after that, um, probably then next year, we'll do um, a 1.0, um, if nothing else um, turns up. Um, the main stuff that's remaining is um, there's some API stuff. Um, I would love some uh, questions, uh, like comments on this. Um, you can leave, open up issues on our um, issue tracker. Um, there is a question of like if we need to add, if there's any other file system APIs we should wrap. I mean, like the mount stuff you don't need because you can use the new mount API with file descriptors. Um, so you don't need that. But like there are other things like atomically creating files and stuff like that um, if people want it. Um, and we probably also want to add support for not allowing mount point crossings for people who need that. Um, it's a little bit complicated to emulate on all the kernels. Um, in theory, you can do it if the file system supports like NFS exports, because there is a syscall called name to handle that that gives you the mount ID. Um, so you can, in theory, emulate it, but it's a little bit finicky. Um, and then, yeah, your idea goes here. Any, any ideas you have, I'm maybe happy to hear them. Um, and yeah, I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks for the talk. I wonder if any of the new Linux API require some privilege or any process can do that. So for open at 2 um, any process can do open at 2 um, And this is actually one of the benefits of not, of not using chroot, because if you, if you want to do with chroot, you need to either unshare the namespace, which you, and you can't always do that in all contexts, or you need to um, have, have other privileges. Um, yeah, open at 2 anyone can do it. For the new mount API, for, um, uh, for uh, FS open and open tree, you need privileges for those. Um, now, in theory, we could, in theory, you can create a new user namespace to get the necessary privileges to create the temporary copy, but um, you can't do that in multi-threaded programs. So, like for in practical purposes, it would be it would be very difficult to get that to work without privileges. Um, but yeah, more of a comment. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's it's unfortunately a fairly common uh, fairly common be problem uh, people run into. I mean, I have more slides if we, uh, if, if there's no more questions. Do we have time? There are no questions. I have another one. Um, how, much, how difficult would it be to have that included in some form in the standard library, for example, in Rust? Uh, in the Rust standard library? Um, um, so, like, the, the actual implementation is not, like, that complicated. Like, I mean, um, it, like it could in theory be included. I mean, like when the Go folks were working on doing their thing, um, I suggested including what we have. The the main issue is that it's it's um, it's Linux specific because we have to use Procfs internally. Now the Go people have an idea of like how you can make this non Linux specific, but like the the C true style nature of it is basically at least Unix specific. Um, and to be honest, I wouldn't say I don't. I'm not sure you can actually make it like as safe on on. Although FreeBSD has now they've implemented the OpenR2 stuff now, so you could actually use it. Um, but yeah, as for putting it in the Rust standard library, um, I'm not sure. I mean, the thing is, the Rust standard library. I mean, this is a common problem with programming languages, not just a Rust problem, but like most programming languages, the way they structure all their file system operations is like all oh, paths of the way you should do everything. Um, and so, like, we could probably add it, but like all the other stuff, in, oops, all the other stuff in in the standard library, you would have to avoid using. So yeah. Um, but yeah, but you can, as I said, it's a, it's a C library, so you can actually package it for distros very easily. In fact, I have an open source package for it already. Yep. Yep. For the Go bindings, do you need to use C Go or how does uh, it work? Yeah, yeah. So it uses C Go. So the the Python and Go bindings just use the C library. Um, uh, I looked at whether we could use um, PyO3 or whatever it's called. Um, 
you know, if someone wants to write a patch for fulfilling that, I'd be, I'd be happy um, to do that. But the, the main reason why we use the C bindings is because they, the plan is for those to be packaged, and so then when we build run C, we can statically build them for our binaries, and also we can, for distros, they can dynamically um, build them. I'm not sure, I'm not sure how, I mean, I have to look into how you would package a PyO3 style thing um, to see how it would work, um, but yeah. I mean, for, sorry, for, and for Go, there's, um, there were some experiments with doing, with doing uh, like direct FFI into Rust from Go, um, but from what I saw, all the experiments with that are like very experimental in nature, and no one's actually like supporting it as an actual thing. Okay. Do we have some more time or no? We get two minutes. Oh, okay, I can I can quickly rush through kernel stuff that we want to do. Um, so uh, one problem I'm working on is that um, magic links are, um, as the name suggests, magical, um, and you can use this to break out of containers very easily. Now um, there is a slight now leaks are bad. Um, very bad, but magic links let you break out of containers if you have any file descriptor leak. Um, and actually, not even like a leak into the container. We had a recent CV uh, earlier this year where we did a leak inside run C, but you could use procfs to pin the a reference so that when you go into the container, you could attack it. It was very frustrating. Um, and uh, there's one thing that's very important to note is that if you're joining a container, you have to set this PR set dumpable flag with PR cuddle. Um, if you don't do that, then a container can very trivially access all your file descriptors and they can access the own file system, which was a CVU we had in 2016. Uh, have one problem that we can fix in the kernel is overwriting binaries. So at the moment, it's possible. It's now, it's now even easier because they've removed some stuff from the kernel that used to protect against this. Where um, you can overwrite host binaries if you have the right privileges. So if you don't, so um, PSA, use user namespaces, please. Um, if you don't use user namespaces, then you can. Uh, there are trivial ways you can overwrite host binaries. In Run C, we we solve this by every time you run Run C, we make a copy of the binary in a memfd, and then we exec the memfd, um, which made the mm folks unhappy. But um, this uh, this kind of is kind of ugly. And there are other ways you could potentially attack it. But yeah, the solution is we can add a kernel patch to restrict reopening. I'm working on it. Uh, it's like it's like the fifth version of the design. Hopefully, it'll um, it'll happen. And then, yeah, also restricting mounts on all magic links would be nice. Um, and yeah, the other stuff is that there's stuff in OpenID too that I might want to add. Um, I'm happy to take suggestions. But yeah, there's stuff like uh, I mean, I know the systemd folks they care a lot about wanting to um, to block um, bad inodes where like opening it would cause a DOS. Um, and there are ways you can detect it, but it requires a lot of extra syscall. So like OpenI2 being able to block those immediately would be nice. Um, blocking all dot dots, not just walking out of the root, would be nice. Um, and saying that would be nice, though I, I have a feeling it wouldn't be accepted, is if you could do like an atomic MK nod, so you can create any inode and get a handle to it in one go. Um, it's something that people want. I mean, and in, in LipArthurs, we would use most of these things if they, if they were around. Um, though this last one will probably be a little bit complicated. But yeah, okay, thank you very much.